Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we're discussing the important work of the First Nations Development Institute in Strengthening Native Communities and Economies in America with special guest, Mike Roberts, President and CEO of the First Nations Development Institute, which is based in Colorado, and Mike is a member of the Tlingit people. Mike, do I, do I have the pronunciation uh, correct? You know, you're one of the few who's got it right, Mark. Clinkett is the right way. Well, I, you know, uh, one always tries. Uh, you know, I fail three quarters of the time, to be perfectly honest. Sometimes my, my mouth doesn't get around the syllables. But but <laughs> thank you for your generous reception of, uh, of, of my uh, pronunciation of your of your people's uh, uh, name. But I'm really so happy that that you're here to help us guide us through. You know, I. I'm I'm bathed in ignorance when it comes to uh, Native American history, uh, uh, practices, traditions, communal society, and I've I've been guided by so many people who are so well aware um, of uh, of that history, and and you know your presence here is just a gift. So thanks a lot. Well, yeah, thank you for having me, Mark. Always excited to talk about. The, the great things that are happening in Indian communities and the, and the great work that we're doing here at First Nations Development Institute. So, uh, Mike, uh, over uh, just under 9 million people in the United States identify at least as, as partially as Native American, Alaskan, and Hawaiian, making up uh, around 2.6 of the total population. And there's been a history of economic dispossession, disrespect, political uh, disempowerment, Cultural destruction that we're all trying to address, and you're you're on the first on the front lines with others. So let's talk a little bit about that inflection point. Before the show, you were mentioning in the 1970s the change in how uh, the interactions unfolded between uh, tribal governments and tribal peoples, and the United States government and and uh, non-native peoples. Could you talk a little bit about? that context and what was what actually happened at that inflection point and, and what has happened since yeah you know it's a it's a really important time in history when we talk about um the ability of native folks in this country to be able to control their own destiny and to create some sort of hope and future orientation um you know under the carter administration um Congress passed the Indian Self-Determination Act. I can I can never remember if it's 1976 or 1978, but somewhere in that time frame. And up until that point in time, everything that happened in Indian reservations, economically, socially, politically, religiously, was controlled by the Bureau of Indian Affairs under the Department of Interior. Every decision that Indian people needed to have made to in their lives, whether that was um, cultural or economic, had to come to the Bureau of Indian Affairs as the wards of Indian people, the, the protector, the caretaker of Indian people. Very and, paternalistic, uh, right? And and oh like if I, if I were the head, the head of that agency, and it was it was always sort of a white European, right? Yeah, it's you know, so even, freaking paternalistic. No, even even our colleagues who who love small government like to be paternalistic when it comes to native folks. Um, but yeah, you know, and the Self Determination Act, you know, really allowed tribes and tribal communities for the first time to start making some of those own decisions for themselves. Unfortunately, the starting point was pretty bleak. You know, I think I shared with you before the show. That if you were to walk onto an Indian reservation in 1976, you would find, from an economic point of view, a command controlled federal government making all decisions economically for tribes who went to work, which industries were on the reservation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the Self Determination Act let folks start to make those decisions for themselves. Um, and that's important because when you look at a functioning economy, for a town, for a municipality, for a state, right? You a want school district, tonight. for goodness sakes. I mean, you know, a local community, pretty much anything, right? Right. But what you want is, you know, there's a kind of like a three-legged stool, right? There's a kind of, there's a there's a part for a government sector in almost every economy, but equal is important. There needs to be a private sector, 
And, you know, we, we, are, we are First Nations and we probably should be as a country very interested in the function of the not-for-profit sector in that economy. And, and so when you, when you have those two other legs being pretty anemic, that, that still doesn't sit up very well, right? Uh, it, it's quite the balancing act. First Nations was really found on the principle that we should make tribal economies healthier, that we should try and find ways in which to create a for-profit or help not, not us create, but to help our com the communities in Indian country create for themselves those for-profit, not-for-profit sectors. And that our job would be to you know, help them find capital and technical assistance to get there. That was the, the big idea behind First Nations. And and the thing about uh, the the relationship between the United States government and various tribal governments is that there were actually a network of treaties that governed. Now the treaties might have been uh, breached on a continual basis, but there were there were government to government, peoples to people agreements that were set up. Right. So the whole idea of self determination. It's not as if this uh, suddenly arose. It actually is rooted in the values of the United States, in the values of, of these different uh, uh, peoples who are included in these agreements and in the agree agreements of, uh, of themselves. So it is the 1975 Act, by the way. It started implementation in 1976, and it began to really to take hold in, in 1978. So you were right on all counts. <laughs> so, so now... That that act passes, right? We now have a real shift between a a, a white European dominant administration, very paternalistic of Native American affairs, to increasingly self determination, uh, culminating in in the changes that are taking place uh, now under the Biden administration with a Secretary of the Interior who is uh, Native. Talk a little bit about that transformation, because that's basically your and my life, right? We lived those times. We lived that change. Talk about how it looked from your perspective. Yeah. So like, just, just to be real clear about like, where do Indians play in our national politic? Our founding documents, our constitution enumerates three sovereigns, the federal government, state government, and tribal government. So this notion of natives controlling their own destiny, creating their own lives and economies from the very founding, right? Now that was, you know, that was the aspirational part of what we declared early on in the late 1700s. You are spot on that we didn't do a very good job of letting that happen or allowing that to happen for 200 years. It wasn't until the Self-Determination Act of 1975 that allow tribes to actually control those own destinies. Right? Oh, it says Section 8 of the United States Constitution. Um, the Congress shall have power to, and then it says, to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states and with the Indian tribes. Right. No, right? I, It's we, right there. We, you and I, right before this, phone, this, this interview, talked a little bit about the most recent Supreme Court case um, with regard to the National Indian Child, the Indian Child Welfare Act that really, I, the the uh, the opinion that that Justice Gorsuch authored, the concurring opinion, enumerates the that sovereignty and the powers that remain to tribes very well. And I th I would advise anybody to go back and read his his opinion because it's a hell of a good history lesson on tribal sovereignty and self determination that really didn't get enacted for two hundred years. But I, I, you know, I, I mean, I got on my soapbox. Now I forgot what you, the, the question so you asked what, me. What, what we were talking about is the change that you and I have lived through. You, you from the perspective of a, a member of the uh, the Tlingit tribe, and me as as a white guy who has later in life learned a lot more from people from inside yeah. of the various uh, tribes. How do you see that change having unfolded since the mid seventies to today? I mean, we're talking now about uh, almost 50 years in which your your and my life have both unfolded, but things have changed and they're they're going to continue to change, aren't they? Yeah, no. I mean, I, I think the 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 world that I live in or you know the world I came from 
as a Clinket tribal member growing up in a, in a small town in Alaska to the world that's today is markedly different. Um, you know, and, and what's really amazing to me is, you know, you, 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 you've mentioned this has been 40 or 50 years. 40 or 50 years is a pretty small bit of time. And you look at the sophistication of tribes and that evolution over a very short period of time, it's pretty stinking amazing. Because in 1975 and 1976, any sort of decision about economy, about employment, about industry recruitment, about workforce development, all these things that we think are important to a thriving economy today, they were controlled by a government. Now, you know, we have seen in the breakup of the Soviet Union, the command-controlled government decision-making and long-term planning isn't the most healthy way to run an economy. And I'm not going to say that capitalism is the right way either. I, I can say right now it works a whole lot better than what they're trying to do over in Russia. But that's what we were doing to Indian tribes, is we were asking them to participate in a, in a very failed economic system. And guess what? They were failing miserably. Right now, you have native they corporations. They, they, along with their their federal government decision makers, were failing miserably. And now you have native corporations. You've got government with diversified um, interests and different ways of of helping uh, different uh, members of the community. Uh, talk a little bit about how your organization functions to uh, continue this march toward empowerment and prosperity. I mean, right, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness enshrined in, in our founding documents. So talk about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness through your eyes um, as, yeah. as you serve people in the First Nation Development Institute. Yeah, you know, I, I, I'm glad you brought this up because it, that's one of my favorite phrases. I always share with people that um, we have in the United States one of the most robust economies that's ever lived in the world and probably ever will. Um, and most of that economy and is built on the stolen assets of Native folks. Land, water, timber, mineral resources. So in many respects, the people who've been omitted from that life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness have been the very people whose assets enabled that for the rest of the country. Right. So, you know, so that being said, um, for First Nations to make this happen, um, we had to recognize a couple things, right? One is that, that we weren't going to be the geniuses in this equation, that, that we could do a couple things here at First Nations really well but mostly what we were doing was leaning on the community partners that we were engaging with on the ground because they understood who, who their communities were. They understand the needs of their people. They understood the limitations and opportunities they had locally. And if we could do our best to help them out and get out of their way, things were going to change rapidly. Um, where First Nations came in, what we were able to, to bring to the party, so to speak, were two things. One is finding a way of accessing capital, right? And I and, I, and we could look at accessing capital in a couple of different ways. One is through grant programs, direct gifts to community organizations to get their work done. And two was finding innovative ways to bring debt capital to reservations where there, where there weren't and still aren't many formal banks or credit unions. So oh, you're talking about investment. We're talking about investment. Interestingly, a little bit kind of equity investment on the on the grant side and a little bit of debt investment on the debt capital so innovation innovative um lending institution side but yes we're talking about investment on, of equity and and debt yes yeah and you're talking about about standard business stuff right return on investment um uh uh the whole issue of of how equity actually works in an equitable way right the whole idea of predictability and stability and laws and the rule of law and understanding what uh, courts actually govern any agreements, right? It's all normal, normal, normal stuff, isn't it? No, I, I, think, I think it really is. I, I'll say that the, the exception for us is 
So I think all these tools of capitalism are really effective tools or can be, right? Oftentimes they come with a, an underlying value system that isn't necessarily congruent with the native communities we work with. And so when we're able to, as best we can, strip the capitalistic value systems from some of those tools, they can be very effective in native communities. A good example, double entry bookkeeping. Now there's there's some there's some values there that play really well in a capitalistic system, but the actual tool itself for keeping track of records and performance and things like that works in any society if used, you know, for the good of the community or the good of the enterprise. Um, so they're, they're you know again if you can strip some of these, but I would I would argue with you. Them, they're really they're really effective tools. I and would argue with you. I think I, I think that that your points are equally valid for anyone, right? Any system is going to have its flaws. One of the flaws of capitalism is that you're not necessarily oriented toward taking care of your counterparty, right? right. You're, you're oriented toward taking care of only yourself and devil take the highmost, right? And what you're saying is that there's a community element to this where you're trying to actually strengthen the entire system systemically while you're actually um, uh, transacting business. I think that's something that we can learn in our capitalist system. I'm a capitalist just like you are, right? But I don't think that that every agreement is flawless. I think that there are ways in which you can ameliorate the negative impacts of this transactional mindset that we have, and get it and get it to be uh, have 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 benefits shared more broadly. And as a matter of fact, the people who founded uh, capitalism, Adam Smith, and those kinds of people, they were thinking in those ways, weren't they? No, no, I, I really think you're, you're spot on there. And I think for us, when we are, are talking with the, the tribal communities we work with, you know, we 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 try and ask the questions about capitalism is you know, for whom and by whom, right? Because I don't think, in general, we have that conversation when we practice business and capitalism in larger U.S. society. For tribal communities, capitalism makes sense when we ask those two questions. Um, when, when you're talking about uh, creating a uh, robust business ecosystem within uh, tribal environments, now, you clearly have a group of people who have all the competencies in the world to provide the the font of leadership uh, for these organizations. What do you and, and and we talked about the access to capital, which is, of course, always a big issue uh, uh, with business. What other kinds of challenges that you think are very specific to Indian country and to the uh, tribal environments that uh, people like me, um, would have to understand in order to navigate appropriately. Yeah, um, a, cu a couple things. Um, if you're going back to 1975, 1976, you would show up in an economy that was an all cash, maybe barter economy, right? You're not talking about sophisticated credit, purchasing orders, things of that nature, right? The things that we kind of take it for granted of, of how business works. In fact, in fact th there would be places probably the majority of reservation economies where you wouldn't have people who really understood how money works, right? This is the whole idea of financial literacy um, wouldn't be present because those decisions were made by the BIA for people, right? So when we were going into reservations and, and trying to help them create a for-profit sector, we ran into some of these things headlong, right? Like we were saying, we want to have classes on entrepreneurship. And, and, and as we're in these entrepreneurship classes, we're recognizing that people don't even understand like how simple earning a earning a paycheck works and how banking works and how having a checking account and credit works, right? So one of the things we quickly found is we had these aspirations of being a more for-profit generating economic development organization. But we quickly learned that the enabling environment, the building blocks to those kinds of skill sets really showed up in the not-for-profit sector, which was equally as bankrupt on reservation, that you didn't have entrepreneurship training programs, you didn't have 
CDFIs, Community Development Financial Institution, Alternative Lending Institutions. You didn't have financial literacy or entrepreneurship classes. These are all things that are provided by the not-for-profit sector, not the for-profit sector, and they needed to be in place for for the for-profit sector to be able to work and evolve. And and part of the issue there is that if you have a transactional-based environment, one side's ignorance of those tools leaves them very vulnerable to exploitation, either purposeful or unintentional, right? Because they they just don't understand the rules of, of a transaction, and they don't understand the infrastructure required to safeguard it. So what you end up with is a series of events that don't lead to a beneficial outcome for one party. It basically tilts the entire uh, field. So how do you address that? How how have you addressed it? And how have tribal nations addressed this issue over the last 50 years? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's. I always tell people it's it's like a small mouse in a big block of cheese, right? It's it's like a small bite at a time for, for, for Indian folks. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, when I came out of my master's of business school program in 1991, there were less than 600 NBAs across Indian country. The entire population of Indian country, less than 600 people had gotten an MBA degree. That was less than one NBA for every tribe out there, right? That's a pretty small number. And I'm guaranteeing you right now that half of those guys who had MBAs weren't working for their tribe. So just the idea of understanding whether we whether we can agree or not on whether MBAs add value and understand business, you know, I'll, I'll you know I'll, I'll be self-deprecating on that one, maybe not, but they at least they understand the tools and the concepts of business more than most. And to say that tribes didn't have that, even have that access to that infrastructure, was pretty amazing, right? It has been a learning by doing process for 45 years for tribes, that tribes have been able to start small enterprises, fail, succeed, somewhere in between, like the rest of the country. We were getting to enjoy that life, liberty, and that pursuit of happiness, finally, after 200 years, because 200 years was the mark of the bicentennial in 1976. 200 years in, we got an opportunity to take a bite of that apple. And so... We have seen a process of 45 years of that um, incremental change, learning, reapply, learning, that success and failure circle, hopefully. And, and I think we've seen a lot more success, right, as tribes. We tribes have gotten much more sophisticated in understanding money and markets and investing. They're making, you know, multi-million dollar, and in some cases, billion dollar investments in industries and facilities today that I don't think any of us, including ourselves, would have imagined 40 years ago. And that is all by the ability of, you know, tribes to be able to do that. And with organizations like First Nations who are willing to invest in that not-for-profit infrastructure, invest in the the equity that communities needed to to do projects and change their lives and, and create hope for their people, all those kinds of things. You know, we've been creating success circles or success cycles for for 45 years now, and it's been incremental. It didn't happen overnight. This wasn't revolutionary. This was a clearly evolutionary process, but but we had to be allowed to evolve that we weren't allowed to before 1976. So as we come to the end of our time, let's focus on one project, one project that you're particularly excited about that, that will have an impact uh, for the young people that that uh, are are in the various uh, tribal nations, uh, and that you think will have the most significant impact, what what would you name? Well, I, I you know what I I mean I'm not even going to like predict, but I'll tell you one that has right. In 1985, we were asked by a group in Pine Ridge, South Dakota, to imagine alongside them a community development financial institution. We, in that point in time, the community created a thing called the Lakota Fund. It was the first peer lending C- CDFI, Community Development Financial Institution, in the United States. The father of the Community Development Financial Institution, Muhammad Yunus, from the Grameen Bank in Bangladesh, yeah. came and visited Pine Ridge because he was so excited about the work they were going to attempt there. They were the first CDFI in Indian country in 1985. 
Today, there are about 95 certified by the Department of Treasury CDFIs. And I would say that's not a testament to anything that First Nations has done. It's been about the strength and determination of tribal communities who saw this model working at Pine Ridge and said, I want one of those in my community because we don't have access to credit for, for personal credit, for business credit, for housing, and we need to have that for our economies to get better. So we're talking about 95 certified CDFIs today with another 40 or 50 waiting certification. The organization that we spun off, First Nations Development Institute, spun off Oista Corporation, who has a $75 million balance sheet and is blowing and going and making loans and helping create CDFIs today. And every one of those CDFIs and their local communities are helping their entrepreneurs dream about bigger business or better business, about safe housing and about personal credit that they couldn't have imagined before. And if that's not a success, I'm not sure where you'd find one. So that is just a great story. You know, we have always prided ourselves in this country of being geniuses when it comes to the development of new ideas and having those new ideas gain purchase to improve people's lives. And what you're basically saying is that this experiment that has gone on for hundreds of years of suppression of voice, suppression of culture, suppression of opportunity, that has served no one. It has served nobody, no one. It has perhaps relocated wealth from uh, people who uh, lived in, in uh, self-determination abundance to others. But now, if we can heal that and create the empowerment within each of the communities, it can actually help everyone. I, I, I want to thank you so much, Mike, for, for sharing at least some of the work that, that you have. And I love that last example of, of how uh, access to capital and the ability to negotiate within an autonomous uh, structure um, has, has really helped uh, people across any uh, country. Michael Roberts, President and CEO of First Nations Development Institute, member of the Tlinga people based in Colorado. Thanks so much for sharing your intelligence on this issue with those of us who still need to learn. Good to Thank you.